is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. This is Bobby Harris, the Executive Director of the Utility Broadband Alliance. And I appreciate you all joining us today for this webinar um, sponsored by Ericsson. The webinar is exploring the capabilities of LTE and 5G that are enhancing the spectrum of use cases for utilities. And we're going to use the GoToWebinar tool that you know many of us have used in the past. You're all in listen-only mode, but if you have questions, we want you to feel free to utilize the question tool in the dashboard of the GoToWebinar Go to tool. Type in your questions. We'll have time at the end for Q&A, and uh, we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions, of course. Um, if we run out of time, then we'll follow up with questions um, via the website or, or via email, of course. But you don't didn't come here to listen to me talk. You certainly came to hear our thought leaders speak. I'm going to turn it over now to Gautam from Ericsson and allow him to take us through the introduction of our wonderful panelists and then get straight into this webinar for today. Gautam? Yeah, thanks, Bobby. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my uh, uh, distinct pleasure to be uh, moderating this uh, panel of experts. Uh, as uh, utilities continue with uh, grid modernization towards wireless networks, uh, it's increasingly important to define the what before we get to the solutions and the how and those, those aspects of it. Uh, I'm Gautam Talgeri, CTO for Utilities at Ericsson. And I have the distinct pleasure of uh, moderating this panel with experts from utilities and the device ecosystem to uh, help us uh, explore use cases for private networks at utilities. We'll also talk about lessons learned and uh, a lot more over the next hour. Uh, the, uh, uh, on, my, on my panel today, we have uh, uh, Chris from uh, Newport Utilities, Alan from Excel Energy, and uh, Jesse from Beck Technologies. I'll uh, now hand this over to them to introduce themselves. Uh, Chris, over to you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon everybody. Uh, I am no expert, but I did sleep at a Holiday Inn Express last night so I could join this elite panel here. Uh, I am the Vice President of Operations and Technology at Newport Utilities in Newport, Tennessee. Uh, for those not familiar with Eastern Tennessee, we are situated right on the border of Tennessee and North Carolina, and uh, our claim to fame is uh, the gateway to the Smoky Mountains. Uh, if anybody uh, is familiar with Appalachia, um, it's, it's a very rural, very mountainous, and uh, has very limited, if any, access to high-speed broadband. So that is the perspective from which I will come from uh, throughout the panel today. Yeah. So, Alan? Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. This is Alan Thorpe. I am a senior project manager at Excel Energy. Uh, I have been involved in the wireless aspect of utilities for more years than I care to remember. I just get depressed when I do. Um, Currently, as of today, located in Denver, Colorado. Just got here from Minneapolis, so uh, still unpacking boxes and glad to be back at work. Thanks, Alan. Um, Jesse, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Lin. I'm the VP of Customer Operation for BEC Technologies. I work with many carriers um, and utilities on deploying, testing, and trialing purpose-built uh, 4G LTE or 5G NR devices for their specific use cases. I also work with a broad range of ecosystem partners, including network infra infrastructure vendors, silicon providers, um, service providers, and software developers to help design and build successful private LTE networks. Thanks, Jesse. And uh, at Ericsson, uh, we are infrastructure vendors uh, across the board in both the IT and the OT space. Uh, over the next hour, uh, I'll 
also add in my insights on uh, uh, on how grid modernization is uh, changing based on uh, the introduction of uh, wireless networks so maybe we should just get started with the with the first question before all of us which is uh, directed towards alan uh, what's driving grid modernization with wireless alan well there's a couple of things it's uh it's the access to frequencies that, that we didn't have before. And it's also the amount of data we need for grid control. As uh, ADMS gets implemented across the industry in various companies, they need more and more and more data, real time or near real time to control the grid. When you couple that with the uh, distributed energy, the wind and the solar <clears throat> that, that we need to have views into, we actually are finding that we need reliable data that reliable networks that we can control. So most utilities have a lot of use cases, but a subset of those bubble up to the top when you look at wireless networks. Uh, the SCADA, the FLIZR, the VOLTVAR, smart metering, AMI backhaul, and LMR. Those just always seem to bubble up and rise to the top. There's others, there's wildfire mitigation, there, there's other things that, that are that is interesting. Uh, but as far as what's driving, uh, it, it's we have the opportunity now to go away from siloed networks to an underlying network that will support multiple use cases and give us real-time or near real-time data for grid control. Great. Thanks, Alan. And what do you think, uh, Chris, from Newport's standpoint? Chris? Oh, goodness. Okay. Our, we were reminded that not to, to, to unmute. Yeah, Newport Utilities, uh, our, our, our primary goal was to uh, deploy fiber throughout uh, Cock County. Um, again, uh, extremely rural, uh, very limited access to high-speed broadband. And, and we were going to use it for our SCADA and, and for AMI metering. Um, However, as we got more and more into the project and, and cost overruns with the deployment of the fiber, and we still hadn't reached half the county, um, fixed wireless access became more and more an option. Um, it was always looked at as a potentiality, uh, primarily in a bridging strategy to, uh, to get us from you know, phase one and two to, to wait till a little while bridge through and then then eventually deploy fiber throughout the rest of the country uh, county but um again the fixed wireless um some of the incentives to do it is that uh, we're getting away from the triple play mode of internet service providers um, you know if we provide the internet the user will decide how they're going to use it so um no longer providing tv if you want to, you know, up in the mountains, we don't have a lot of cell coverage. People live by their landline telephone. Um, that is their that is their lifeline out. But what we what we've been able to do is switch them to Wi-Fi calling, um, provided they've got the the internet. Um, so uh, there's things that are that are changing within the, the way people use technology that uh, drove us towards the fixed wireless access. Um, Again, the, key, the network that we put up in our county right now is capable of carrying about 8,000 customers. I've only got 68 on there, but, uh, but we're, we're, we're beginning to start to uh, bring more and more on. And uh, everybody that has been using it throughout our operational testing has been extremely pleased with, with, the, uh, with the performance of the fixed wireless access for high-speed broadband to, to run their entire household. So. Um, that's what I've got. Yeah, great. And uh, from a device standpoint, uh, Jesse, uh, do you believe that both the MBB and the fixed wireless aspects are covered or? Um, yes. Um, fixed wireless access and mobile broadband, I think they both are different uh, applications and use cases. Um, it's almost like uh, capacity versus coverage, uh, which are both important for a private LTE network. Um, 
fixed wireless access are high bandwidth driven applications. Um, some considerations are you have to have guaranteed bandwidth, uh, minimal RF fluctuations, um, sufficient bandwidth and RF resource are the key uh, for successful fixed wireless access deployment. Um, the use cases for mobile broadband, uh, it's more for utility, it's more operational measurement, uh, like SCADA, Flitter, what Alan mentioned. Such operation requires high availability, uh, wider coverage, and roaming flexibilities. Um, so, you know, one option is, in addition to private network, um, you can roam on the commercial network. Um, that's one consideration. And other consideration for mobile broadband and fixed wireless uh, coexist network, you might wanna consider assigning network resources based on peak operation, peak operation hours. Uh, for example, like um, you can assign more resource to mobile broadband from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. for fixed wireless access from 6 p.m. to 12 a.m. So those are type of um, uh, considerations when you're you know, adding fixed wireless access and mobile broadband in a single private network. Yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, uh, the part about which all three of you have brought out about multi-purpose networks, right? Networks being used for multiple reasons, multiple purposes. Uh, the aspects of uh, latency and performance are, of course, the two things which uh, uh, drive the uh, evolution of any network. And what's interesting is that a lot of use cases are uh, uh, built within a substation in an example. And uh, because you're working with uh, devices that need quick latency, you tend to have control that's within that area, but not extended out. And when you bring in a wireless solution that can work with low latency over long distances, then that works well for all the different use cases that we're discussing, including, you know, maybe extending the area of control for what your control, what you're working with uh, within a substation or within a, a, a grid. So, yeah, interesting discussion. So let's move on to the next topic here on uh, on the relevance of uh, private networks versus public networks. So, uh, Chris, uh, if I could pose you the question on why do we need private networks? I'm gonna get that mute button before I'm done here. Um, I'm gonna take it from, again, a different perspective being an internet service provider and not necessarily using it uh, for our, primarily our smart grid operation. Um, we're in, again, a very unforgiving uh, op area in, in the mountains of Eastern Tennessee. Uh, it's rural, it's very mountainous, most people don't realize that the Smoky Mountains are actually a rainforest. So being able to um, get fiber up and down the mountains and you know get the trucks up and down and out through through all of the mountainous area is not easy. So again, that, that led to cost overruns as far as the fiber deployment and kind of sent us in the direction of fixed wireless. And if we could optimally uh, set up where we were putting our towers, just like any cell phone network, um, you could capture a much greater population, much quicker and actually cheaper. Um, again, there are problems in having shadows uh, in some of the hollers is, is what they call them here, in some of the ravines, um, but it is possible to bounce it with, with microwave bounce. We've actually uh, tested that and got very, very, very good results with that. Uh, so for about a hundred dollars, customers can actually buy their own microwave equipment and bounce it off of, of different places to get it down into areas that are shadowed from our from our line of sight uh, antennas. But uh, again, this was never meant to be long term. It was meant to be a bridging strategy for the deployment of the fiber. But you know, obviously, as we continue to use it, if it continues to perform and receive very high marks, 
um, you know, there's a chance that uh, there, there won't be a reason to put the costly fiber out that could get torn down in storms. Um, you know, again, it's, it's a mountainous region with, with a lot of trees. Um, so, uh, you know, it tears apart our electric system all the time. If, it's, if, if I don't have to put fiber out there to get torn up, you know, it's, it just makes for another, another use case that we have. Thanks, Chris. And uh, Alan, what do you think about the need for private networks? Well, utilities, to, to, to latch on to what Chris is talking about, utilities, you know, our, our only goal is to keep the power on, as far as the customer is concerned. So when we use, we can use uh, commercial wireless, and we all do use it all over and use it all the time, because that's our only option. But Consumer grade wireless is not suited for mission critical applications. I mean, what we do requires greater security and reliability than they provide. So what we get when we use commercial wireless is best effort. They, they do best effort at restoration. Uh, we can pay a little more and get some, some priority and some, you know, uh, some queuing relief. But if you build your own network, then you get to set those QoSs and you get to set what levels, as Jesse said, how you want to use the network and when you want to use the network. Uh, so utilities, you need utility grade communications, not commercial grade uh, communications. And that's why, you know, a lot of utilities are looking at, at, at migrating over to a private wireless network to run their uh, grid control and grid applications. Yeah. I agree, Alan. That that's a very important point. The the part that uh, where you mention on controlling the uh, the characteristics of your network, uh, having a private network does provide the uh, utility, the operate the option to uh, set the different QoS levels, which are not used in a commercial network. Uh, you're also not uh, overpowered by uh, consumers who are uh, uh, taking capacity out of the network for something that transitionary. So it's yeah. a very steady way of working. That's exactly network. right. If if we have our own network, we're not fighting for RF resources with uh, Junior over here watching Netflix late at night. So exactly. Uh, so Jesse, what do you think on uh, the use for use of private networks from a device standpoint? Uh, from device standpoint, I think it's uh, the same as what the utility has been looking for. Um, the use cases uh, and performance requirements, they're not the same uh, as the commercial networks. Um, commercial networks are entertainment driven. You know, they're revenue driven. But utility networks are designed for essential services. So utility can operate their generation, transmission, distribution network without a fast and reliable telecommunications. So utility need a network with high availability, low latency, stringent security, all that owned and controlled by the utilities. I think that's the main key point there. They, they have the control. Um, for securities, uh, with a private network, you can implement events in encryptions and authentications or dedicated APNs or for special services, you can use um, VPN tunnels. On top of that, with a private network, utilities have the option to use purpose-built devices that are designed for utilities grid equipment. Um, for example, they can find a device that's custom built for custom form factor built for their uh, enclosures, type of antenna that can mount it on top of their uh, capacitor bank controllers or reclosers. So those are some of the flexibilities that utility have to when when they have a private network. They have total control. And in addition to that, they can also configure the network that best accommodate their applications. For example, like, you know, you can allocate, 
allocate guaranteed bandwidth for video surveillance or streaming. You can classify service levels on different grid operations, AMI or voltage sensors. That's all the reason why utilities need private networks. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, so now we could probably switch tracks to something that's uh, uh, very important to the deployment of any wireless network, and that is uh, spectrum. Uh, and when it comes to spectrum, you got low band, mid band, and of course, as you move into uh, 5G, you start talking about high band and millimeter wave. The part which becomes very relevant to the deployment of uh, a private network for utilities is, of course, the low band. And uh, it becomes important because uh, low band works very well, given that uh, although the, uh, uh, the throughputs are relatively lower in, uh, in, in, in low band spectrum, uh, coverage is very good, uh, just pure physics of the RF. Uh, and coverage needs are so critical to uh, reliability in a, in a utilities network. The, the other thing about uh, uh, low band coverage is uh, you can use low band to go over a couple of miles in a rural environment. And uh, one of the main discussion points about deploying with wireless, which is penetration, does it go, does it go to go through uh, foliage? Does it work equally well in uh, summer and winter or fall? Uh, low band is a little less uh, 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 picky about uh, the RF environment, given that it can penetrate more. Um, then there's other interesting aspect of, uh, you know, with, with the carrier aggregation, which comes with uh, uh, wireless, when you aggregate uh, low band spectrum with uh, mid band, then you got the right combination of good coverage and the addition of capacity coming from mid band. So uh, uh, in, the, in the case of the 900 band eight spectrum that uh, uh, utilities have started working with now, uh, getting that to work with mid band, well, that's a standardization pro procedure. We've got to go through that process of uh, getting 3GPP to bring 900 together with mid band. But that's, that's something which we're all working together with. Uh, and from an infrastructure infrastructure point standpoint, of course, uh, you know, 600 megahertz, 700, those are well-established ecosystems. So uh, it gets interesting when when we when we see that uh, you know you got spectrum coming in from uh, uh, 900 uh, or the 900 megahertz, and uh, even the 450 that's developing out in Europe, which is eventually going to make its way into the into the US also. The one other aspect I'd like to highlight before I uh, uh, discuss this further with the panel is uh, the fact about uh, spectrum sharing. It's interesting that uh, when you're working with FDD spectrum, low band, mid band, it doesn't matter, but uh, especially with low band, there is uh, availability in the industry now or uh, uh, sharing the same spectrum for traditional LTE on one hand, and selectively using a part of that in real time uh, for uh, low latency uh, 5G as we go forward into the next couple of years. So overall, from, as an infrastructure provider, we see a lot of promise in, uh, in low band and we are glad to see that it's available for utilities to use. Uh, and this is something which uh, probably, Alan, uh, what do you think? What are your insights on uh, the use of a sub one gig spectrum and low band? Well, it's, uh, you know, when we look at it and you hit on a lot of it, uh, all the utilities ha have been involved in, in the WiMAX frequencies and the rules changes and we got impacted by that. But when you look at, let's take the 900 megahertz, rule of thumb is a 900 megahertz site will cover roughly three times what a 3.5 gigahertz site will cover. Mm -hmm. So we're not in the business our business model is not a commercial carrier. So the less sites that we can build to cover the areas we want to cover, and then we have to carry and feed those sites going forward, that's attractive. But you have to understand when you when you get into this game, you have to define your requirements up front. You know what you want to cover, what your latencies are, and you have to be very clear. You have to work with your business units. Some people here 
well, we're going to do a broadband network and they think, well, you know, we can do away with our cell phones and we can replace all of our mobiles. You really don't want to get into the 10 digit dial game. That's not what we, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about fixed wireless. We're talking about, you know, mobile data terminals. We're talking about a pipe to move information to and from. We're not talking about phone calls. The closest we would get to phone calls would be uh, mission critical push to talk over the top of LM, uh, LTE replacing LMR. But understand what you want to do from a requirements perspective and also understand your organizational limitations. Utilities are not set up to design and build and care for this type of network. So under, decide first early on what you want to do as a utility. Do you want to design it? get some help? Do you want to throw it to your knock when you get it cut over? Do you want to acquire the skill set to make it work? How do you want to play this? And then set realistic time frames. This is not easy. This is, this is, I look at it like every site you build is a mini project. This site may work. I think Chris can, can, can vouch for this. You may think this next site's going to be great and the tower doesn't pass structural or you've got some kind of FAA limitations or you've got something that you got to move. Every site's a mini project. So if you want to build 350 sites, you got 350 mini projects. If you want to build 200 sites, you got 200 mini projects. So be very careful and set realistic time frames. Leverage your existing infrastructure to the fullest possible extent to drive the cost lower. And then future-proof to the fullest possible extent. What I mean by that is you may only want to build your metro areas, but if you can acquire the frequencies in all of your distribution territory or your transmission territory or your generation territory for future use cases and future to expand the network for future and to get that part of your business onto a common network, think about that up front. Very, 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 very true. Because uh, especially the part about uh, you know each site being a mini project, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, you know planning out and uh, site uh, surveying and uh, scoping out the uh, complexities of different sites. And uh, um, by the right amount of planning, uh, you know hopefully the number of mini projects do come down. Yeah. Something that's more manageable. And I think but we, this, yeah, I think we've all dealt with you know let's just say we've got 20 sites to build and one of them is the 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 site that that won't that won't cooperate. So we get 19 built and we've got one laying out there. People are saying, well, when's the project going to be done? That one site's holding us up. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, what are your experiences with this? What do you think? Well, first, I was trying to find enough, anything yellow so I could throw a flag on Allen and Harvard because he was taking some of my, you know, requirements-based uh, Well, Well said, Alan. Um, I will tell you, I can't speak Spectrum with, with Alan, nor with Jesse, but what I can tell you is that, you know, we're in the CBRS spectrum. We rely on our SAS provider to, to assign the frequencies that, that uh, our, our bands use. So we're right in that mid-band. We're using three-carrier aggregation. We've got, we've got the best equipment that, that uh, Ericsson had to offer with 64T, 64 radios. So... You know we're five G ready when 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 that time comes. But uh, you know Alan's absolutely correct. You know, getting that spectrum and having it prepared for you know when you're there is important. But uh, again, we're taking baby steps right now. Uh, we're we're in, you know initial operational uh, completion, not not even near final operation. Um, so the other thing that I would say, and it goes back a little bit to your your private networking and, and Alan touched upon this as well is, you know, one reason we haven't jumped into it full, you know, especially on my electric side and my IT side with the SCADA system is because of cybersecurity. Um, you know, that, that's, that's something we have to think about is, is how secure are these networks, um, yeah, mainly because we're talking about the grid. We're talking about things that are, are newsworthy, um, to, to, to put it lightly, especially with where we're at in today's world. Um, so, you know, those are things that you have to say, but, but Alan hit it right on the head when he said it's got to be requirements based. It's got to be thought out as much as you can in advance. And again, one of the points that I'll make in, in the future, in a, in a future discussion here with you all is, hey, bring in the experts. There's no way you can know it all. Um, and I'll touch upon that in some, some other uh, pieces of, of our discussion. 
Thanks, Chris. Uh, Jesse, uh, what are your thoughts on this? I want to go back to the uh, the point that we all made earlier, uh, the licensed or interference-free spectrum is important for utility operations or utility wireless networks. Um, either that's low band or mid band or high band. Of course, low band, um, because it's a low wavelength, you know, provides the propagations, extend the geographic reach or coverage, um, and also has a better in-building or tree pen penetration, um, ideal to expand the, the coverage in, in, in all of the uh, deployment scenarios. Um, high band or mid band it gives you, it'll give you capacity, um, although a little bit less propagation, but that's the, the good thing about network, the infrastructure side, as well as on the device side, we all have that flexibility combining some of those spectrums in multiple applications. Uh, uh, Gautam men mentioned earlier, uh, we can combine a low band spectrum with a mid band uh, in, in, in a way to increase both the capacity and coverage. Um, so th those are some of the benefits uh, that the current technologies uh, offer us today. Uh, either that's 900 megahertz, 600 megahertz, or 700 megahertz. Um, we also have a lot of uh, off-the-shelf uh, RF modules available out there by various vendors. Uh, these available modules greatly help and enable custom device development, uh, which can incorporate options for band combinations, uh, antenna designs, type of interfaces, um, or form factors, as, as we mentioned earlier, that fit into the, uh, the enclosure. At the end of the day, use cases and applications will drive the design and development of the LTE devices. And UBVA has a well-organized ecosystem uh, program that is participated by a number of chipset, software, device, network vendors, uh, which drives the acceleration of private LTE network deployment for utilities, as well as help uh, drive uh, potentially new industry standards. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, so that with the discussion on low band, I think it's uh, natural to switch over to uh, a larger discussion on the working between uh, uh, fixed wireless and mobile broadband in a single network. Uh, so uh, Chris, is there some thoughts you have since you have deployed fixed wireless already? Yeah, and I would I would tell you that um, planning and designing again it goes back to what Alan was saying be requirements based, being able to get your propagation mapping out there so you know what you're dealing with. Uh, I heard Jesse talk about you know propagation through you know foliage, and again, I have a lot of my op area is in a rainforest, so how is it going to do through there? And I can tell you that through some operational testing that we've done um, on a, it's actually a tiny homes community. Um, so it's one of those little tiny home things on trailers. Uh, we put a bunch of fixed wires access there and they're in a woods. They're in a, they're in a very densely, you know, uh, covered area with trees and their speeds have been in the 200. So uh, it's done actually very, very, very well there. But again, the more you can plan in advance where your sites go, um, realize that the maintaining of it is expensive. If you're not a cellular phone company or somebody who has fixed wireless across the nation, where you have a network operations center that's monitoring those sites seven by 24, you're gonna have to have somebody do it. Um, and you're gonna have to pay for somebody to do it. So uh, it will cost you money to, to for the O and M of those sites because they're very complex 
electronic equipment. And if you want them to be, you know, they are reliable, but they do burn and they need to be reset. They need to be, you know, it's just like, it's just like your Microsoft computer. You need to reboot it every so often to get it to run at its best. Um, sorry if there's anybody from Microsoft on there. Uh, but, but, you know, that, that's what that maintenance is for. And, and you bring the pros in to do that. No, nope. I'm a hundred person utility company and 65 of them are linemen. <laughs> so I don't have the resources to throw at that. So I have to bring the experts in and use them. Just be aware of that. If you're going to do a fixed wireless access type project in your area, um, there's a lot more of it than just throwing it up on the antenna and you know, set it and forget it. It's not the way it's going to work for you. Um, and I, like I said earlier, microwave, microwave hops do work. You know, you don't want to rely on those, but, uh, it, it, you know, for instance, I don't want to have to take my fiber all the way up that mountain, but it's got a great site for me to put my, my, uh, my fixed wireless site. I'm going to put one up there and I'm going to bounce it from another place that, that has line of sight to it. So um, you can cut down your costs there because every one of these macro sites and, my, and, and the small cells, requires fiber to a certain extent. So you have to bring fiber there originally. So if you don't have fiber there already, again, that's all part of that planning and the propagation maps that you need to start with. So uh, that's my advice. Bring in the experts. Don't try to do something that is not uh, right in your wheelhouse. Thanks, Chris. And, and your point about, uh, you know, use the uh, prudent use of microwave and multi-user MIMO to, uh, you know, replace fiber. To some extent, I think that's that's a pretty viable uh, use case. Uh, so, uh, Jesse, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, fixed wireless MBB on devices? Uh, on device perspective, um, because there are two different use cases. Uh, most likely, there are two different form factors, different design of antenna for fixed wireless access. There are typically outdoor rocketized devices um, with embedded high gain antennas, uh, directional antennas. Uh, they're typically for fixed fixed mount or line of sight installations. Um, some of the operation considerations um, for fixed wireless device would be uh, you would need a fixed bandwidth or a guaranteed bandwidth. Uh, predictable RF conditions, uh, minimal fluctuations in terms of RF. Uh, you should be capable of um, um, position or lock to a certain certain sector, uh, not hopping around in different styles. So that's that's for fixed wireless access. For mobile broadband, uh, typically I think about tablets. Uh, in vehicle devices or um, USB hotspot, the operational considerations uh, to me, there are roaming devices with dynamic RF conditions, uh, typically, uh, or you know, may have the option to install an external antenna. And of course, uh, when it roams, you'll require failover uh, or dual SIMs. Um, those are some of the characteristics of uh, the, the mobile broadband devices. Uh, either mobile broadband devices or fixed wireless devices, they all should be flexible of configuration or installation depends on the use case. Um, they also have to have the capability to combine different spectrums or, you know, um, able to uh, add additional or external antenna for extended coverage. Overall, I think purpose-built devices for the use cases is the common goal. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, and Alan, uh, what do you think? Well, when we're, when we're talking about the network and planning it out uh, for FWA or MBB, uh, I'm going to go back to the R word, your requirements first. Another thing I'd like to say is you can is you can look at your requirements, focus on your value areas. Those would be your phase one, maybe your only phase. 
but if you've got a metro area where you have a lot of fixed SCADA points, you have mobile data terminals, you can, you can, the biggest bang for the buck. But I'll go back, I'll go to something that, that we've all hit around on, and I think it's important. When you do your RF plots initially, and you understand your requirements, and your RF plots say that this area is going to be covered by this side at, at this signal strength, do a drive test. Baseline your RF design, because if your RF design is wrong, you, you can't make it work like you want it to work. So you're going to have to drive test your initial RF plots to get a comfort level that they're correct. Then you don't have to. You might want to do it sporadically, but you need to understand that your RF design is correct, covering what you want to cover. Uh, I've said this before. You need to decide what you're going to in-house, what you're going to outsource. And for utilities, it's actually a paradigm shift where we, we're so focused on building siloed networks for single purposes. You're focused on that and that along for years and years. Utilities now have to switch to a holistic design that says, okay, I'm gonna design this network and I'm picking up this, this, and this use case where before I was just picking up one for my network. That's a different thought process. Get that socialized within your organization early on. It's a very, very important point about the RF design. And, and it's interesting that, you know, the part you brought up about uh, using a, a holistic design, a multipurpose network, uh, the, the way the, the thing is that between FW and MBB, the, the networks and the way that they're built are very similar, except for, of course, traffic models and uh, throughputs and focus of uh, energy, RF energy. Uh, processes are very similar. So that's what, from an infrastructure standpoint, deploying an MBB or an FWN network is, uh, is not as complicated as it sounds because uh, other than the radios, most of the infrastructure is common between uh, fixed wireless and MBB. The baseband's are the same, the microwaves are the same, sites are similar. Um, so it makes it a little easier to uh, move from one to the other. Of course, goes back to your point, our design is what drives the way that you build these networks. Uh, the uh, partitioning of spectrum, uh, I think uh, Jesse mentioned that some time back. The, the ability in the technology to partition on the real time between uh, fixed wireless and MBB, that's something that's there in LTE even today, where we are able to either have soft or hard uh, partitions for uh, capacity in the same spectrum. So you're able to use the same spectrum for both use cases or multiple use cases uh, and uh, build the, uh, uh, what we call RAN slicing into it. Uh, so that, that helps in building a multipurpose network. And of course, like uh, Chris mentioned before, uh, when you use something like multi-user MIMO, uh, you're able to focus the energy towards a specific area of coverage cutting out interference from the other sides. And that helps in deploying uh, fixed wireless in a certain part of a network with the appropriate radios and solution and uh, doing MBB for the rest. So uh, um, it's, it's interesting that we're able to build a network that does multiple things, including uh, mobile broadband and fixed wireless. Yeah, great discussion. So uh, as we, uh, move towards the close of our uh, of our panel today. Uh, I'd like to uh, walk through some lessons learned and best practices, and maybe we can start with you, Jesse. What do you see? Um, I think my thoughts are the same with Chris and Alan and Gotham as well. Uh, right from the get-go, planning is most important. Plan your network for your use cases. You know, consider all factors, uh, plan the capacity, the coverage, the density, and plan for future growth. Um, RF predictions, survey, dry test, those are very important as well. Um, my experience uh, tells me uh, dry test is best with the actual device that you are, you're gonna be using. Um, um, and of course, a proper installation saves a million. Okay. Um, with devices installed out there, uh, if they weren't uh, installed 
properly, correctly. You have to go back out there and do another truck road. Uh, the investment is gone. So you have to document standard installation and configuration procedures for your crew, for your team. Um, provide frequent training for the installers and technicians about RF alignments, antenna positions, and for the mid-band utilities, uh, if necessary, encourage your staff to obtain the SAS CPI training and certifications. Um, those would help reduce a lot of time out there in terms of installation as well as failure down the road. Another great point is um, you got to have remote monitoring and visibility to the devices out there um, to collect the stats, um, have proper proper failure alerts, ensure tools are selected to monitor devices in the field to prevent uh, failures. Those are my thoughts. Yeah. Thanks, Jesse. Um, Alan, uh, what did you say are lessons learned and best practices? Uh, just understand that use cases are specific to each utility. Like Chris's use cases and our use cases are not the same. There's some elements that are the same. Even across different areas of utilities, the use cases will be, some will be more important than others. Uh, no single use case will justify the build of a private LTE network. It, you have to stack use cases to make the business case work. You just need to understand that going in and just just be you know open and socializing it within the utility itself as to what you're trying to do. You're trying to move away from a siloed to a holistic design and see if you can get buy-in. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so Chris, uh, best practices and lessons learned? Yeah, I would agree with everything that Jesse and Alan uh, have mentioned, but uh, again, my my situation is very different, as, as Alan pointed out. But bring the experts in early. If I could, if I tell anybody, bring those people in early. When you're getting into a new world, you know there's some areas that that are, that are cross-functional that you're going to have experience before, but not everything. Um, when you start to get into the regular regulatory aspects of the deployment, you know you're going to get permits, land site acquisition easements. FAA clearances. If your towers are tall enough, you're going to get FAA clearances. Now, and I'll give you a one little uh, horror story. We had a macro site plan, 125 foot, in a spot that was going to feed northern part of my county. And uh, lo and behold, find out that there's an FAA hold on the airspace there because uh, 25 years ago, a gentleman who was a, uh, a flying hobbyist wanted to build a grass airport up in that area. He uh, he's, he's been deceased for a while, Rem remarkably enough in an airplane accident, but he he still had a hold on the FAA um, airspace up there. And his wife would not allow me to take it because she said it was his dream. So I could not build my, my, my tower up there. So I had to completely drop back and punt in that area of the network. So. That's not something I, as a as vice president of operations and technology at, at a small utility, would have ever thought about, but the experts did. So bring them in, take advantage of their knowledge and experience. They, they, they've probably been through it before, and they're gonna they're gonna save you a lot of heartache. And your hair won't turn this color. So, uh, but um, you know, same same thing. SaaS providers, you know, some of those things, SIM cards. Those are all things that we're not used to. You know, Jesse, he deals with it all the time, but, but you know, us as, as the uh, end user or the internet service provider for the customers, not, not our expertise, not our, not in our wheelhouse. So take advantage of them, make sure you have the right people on your team and, and you have to develop that trust because it's expensive. It's an expensive project. So you're gonna be, you're gonna be putting a lot of faith in these people. Great, thanks Chris. So I think from uh, from an, from an infrastructure standpoint, I would think that some of the uh, lessons and best practices we've had from our many deployments is we've got to have network solutions at scale with the use cases. 
So having expandability in the network is important. Uh, that allows you to start small and uh, build as needed. Uh, we got to uh, you know, bring the uh, redundancy to single points of failure. Right? That's a continuing uh, uh, update to the network to ensure that there are no single points of failure. We're able to increase the reliability and the security. So all those are some of the, uh, the drivers here. Uh, so I think I would probably hand it back to Bobby to take uh, audience questions now. Great. Uh, thank you all, first of all, so much. Uh, terrific, um, terrific session. We have just a few questions and we've got a few minutes, so I'll take them in order um, with the first one. Um, for fixed wireless access, what is the ULDL, I'm assuming that means upload download speeds, um, that are being deployed? And that's out to anyone who would like to answer that. I didn't hear the last part of that question, Bobby. Can you repeat that? Sure. For fixed wireless um, access, what is the upload download speed that's being deployed? Well, I'll be glad to answer that. I can tell you what ours is, is, is again, for, for a high speed broadband uh, classification, the FCC is going to put you at 25.3. So 25 up. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 23 down, 25 down, three up. Um, but we're going for much higher than that. It, you know, uh, you're not going to get the symmetric uh, with the fixed wireless like you will with the fiber. But um, again, with the, the customers that we have hooked up to it right now, we're hoping to stay above that, that 100 uh, download speed as much as possible. Um, again, we'll know that when we start to. Uh, load the, the sites up um, we haven't we have we haven't got there to uh, stress test them if you will but but we're looking to get a hundred and and probably 20 download but again when you've never had internet that that's the amazing thing when you go to these people's houses that have never had access to high-speed internet and they start seeing the speeds that we're providing them now they think they're getting a gig as far as they're concerned so um, it's all it's all relative yeah, exactly. And and from that uh, standpoint, from a technology perspective, based on the RF planning and the distance from the site, uh, we normally would identify rings. And those rings would show that you can get uh, throughput going all the way up to 100 megabits per second when you use a multi-user MIMO with uh, 20 to 40 megahertz of spectrum. Uh, so maybe you can go to the next question yes. if there's no other response. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, the next one is specifically for you, Chris. Um, the question says, when fiber cost ran high, how did you educate your management team on the stability and capacity of a fixed wireless solution? And unmute. <laughs> yeah, you're muted, uh, Chris. I wouldn't use. I wouldn't answer it the way that I'd like to, but I, I will tell you, I've kissed the Barney Stone, so I'm, uh, I'm rather rather talented at, at baloney. We'll say, no, you're you're going to have to keep talking because nobody, you know, they're not going to believe it. Especially, and I wouldn't even say management is as hard to con convince as you are your customers, because when your customers have heard fiber, they want fiber, and when you tell them, I'm not going to be able to bring you fiber, I'm, I'm going to bring you fixed wireless. Well, what's that? And so, you know, that, that marketing has taken some time. And again, I relied on my, my wireless experts, uh, the consultant team that, that was working with us. Um, but with, there was some convention of management. And, and again, there was some convincing myself because until I saw it, I, I didn't know what to believe because I haven't dealt with it um, other than through my own cell phone like everybody else. And, and, you know, we use Jesse's product. Uh, that was the first time I'd seen it work. We were using BEC and, and I was impressed. You know, we put it up, we got these tripods and put it up like it was on the side of a house at 18 feet or so. And the, the, the distance that we were able to get and the speeds we were able to get was, was uh, pretty impressive. So that's where you're gonna convince people is by showing them. Telling them is never really gonna ever convince people. 
showing them that it works is what convinces them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another good question just came in. Um, what and, and Alan, I think you mentioned something a little bit about this, but what are the challenges of setting up a knock for these private networks? Well, um, most of us, from the utility perspective, already have a knock. Uh, how deep that gets into your network, what it looks at, it, it's different for every utility. So, but but the challenges would be whether you're setting one up or whether you have one is to develop or acquire the skill set needed to maintain and operate a wireless network. I mean, our microwave is, for all intents, it is wireless, but it's you know point to point. So I think we had mentioned earlier that th this is this is not, uh, I think Chris mentioned, this is not set it and forget it. This requires maintenance, it requires uh, monitoring. So you have to get those skill sets in. Now, there, there's various ways to do that. You can go raid knocks of wireless companies, but we're, we generally are not too successful at that, or you can grow those skills internally. That would be probably what, what would happen. Uh, I know some of the utilities that are that are looking at this are, are, are working with some of the uh, infrastructure providers, so the infrastructure providers can bring their NOC personnel up to speed and give them training that they need to monitor and maintain these networks. Great, thanks, Alan. Um, there's another question. Um, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, we're seeing a trend that utility companies may start providing high-speed internet for customers as a service. In mm -hmm. regions with already well-established ISPs, what would make sense for a utility to um, set up such a service to compete with an ISP? Any oh, oh, me, me, me. <laughs> Chris. I don't do it. <laughs> you know, you can, you can overbuild, and I will tell you that the phase one of our fiber deployment, we talked about cost overruns. Phase one of our fiber build out was an overbuild. So we were building when there was a competitor, very, very large competitor. And my take rates outside of the city are in the 40 to 50% range where I would expect them to be. My take rates in, inside the city where the competition is, is below 20%. And I can't compete with him, him or her. I don't know how you, how you refer to companies nowadays, but um, they, they can undercut you and they will. They'll do it for, you know, for three months. And for somebody who's in a distressed county and is living paycheck to paycheck, going through a pandemic, they're gonna take that extra 10 bucks every day. And they'll figure it out at the end of three months and they'll balk on the contract. They'll get out of it somehow. But, you know, that's the big thing with the big guys. They'll, they're going to put these the people in the contract and then sap them later. But they will they will make it very difficult on you. So be, doing an overbuild as a utility is, is difficult. Even though you think that you've got the trust and respect of the community because you're there, you're part of them, you, you live there with them, you know, all of the economic advantages that goes into it goes right back into the community it, it sounds great it looks good on paper it, it's gonna it's gonna sell well on a business plan but it's not gonna happen and it's not gonna come to fruition at the end of the day because people living paycheck to paycheck are gonna go by the cheapest that they can get what they need um, and a small utility like ours can't compete with with the big guys and that comes to Grants and federal funding, I've found that because I've, I've been a grant writer for the last two years. And uh, it's very difficult when you go into reverse auctions against some of these big people. I, I can't compete with them. And I, it, it's, it makes it very difficult. So if you don't, if, if you don't have to compete with them, that's, that's better. If you can get the internet, what we've kind of come to the, the final is, we just want to make sure that everyone has access to it. I don't want to provide, I don't want to be competitive in the marketplace necessarily. I want to make sure that my community has access to the internet because we feel that generation after generation is falling behind um, without it. And very soon here, you're going to find out that you can't live without it. You can't school with it, educate and school without it. You can't work without it. It's, it's just going to be a requirement. 
Excellent. Sorry for the long windedness. That's okay. Um, Gautam, we're actually right at our time, but I want to give you, uh, we'll get to those other questions um, uh, at another time, but let me turn it back to you for a final wrap up. Yeah. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Jesse, Chris, and Alan for a very interesting uh, session today. Uh, appreciate all the uh, all the thoughts and the discussion. I'd also like to uh, thank Oba for uh, organizing this webinar for us. So uh, uh, with this, I think we can bring the panel to a close. Uh, any closing uh, statements, uh, Alan, Jesse, since we're out of time? Chris? I just thank everybody for joining. Enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, thank you. I always enjoy this this group, and and for anybody out there that's thinking about doing a fixed wireless um, deployment, either for their for their utility or as an internet service provider, get in touch with me. Please come out, see it firsthand before you before you jump in. Um, I'd be glad to share all of my scars and uh, show you where where the where. Uh, our wins are have been as well. Excellent. Well, I just want to say that access to protective uh, protective spectrum and advanced wireless network technology and a purpose built device will ensure utility over es essential services up to government and public expectations. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bobby. My pleasure. Thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we will have this recording ready for uh, everyone to listen to on demand. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Bye.